watu wa Mungu hamjambo watu wa Mungu bwana asifiwe god is good and all the time it's time for bible study so what we will do is we will actually study the bible so that we can understand what it means to be transformed by prayer let's pray father in heaven teach us to pray in jesus name we pray amen luke chapter 18 luke chapter 18 bible study is studying the bible so get a bible luke chapter 18 we will read verse 1 to 8 because this is the basis of our belief that we are transformed by prayer after reading we will get some seven points and after getting those seven points you will ask questions i will give answers i will ask you questions you will give answers and we will end so prepare the questions and we will work on it luke chapter 18 verse 1 to 8 the bible says then jesus told his disciples a parable to show that they should always pray and not give up persistence in prayer verse 2 jesus said in a certain town There was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. Verse 3. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to Jesus with the plea come he kept coming to the judge with a plea grant me justice against my adversary her plea was grant me justice against my adversary that was her prayer verse 4 for, for some time he refused but finally he said to himself even though i don't fear god or care what people think verse 5 yet because this widow keeps bothering me keeps persisting keeps persisting keeps bothering me i will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me verse 6 and the lord said listen to what the unjust judge says verse 7 and will not god bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night will god keep putting them off verse 8 I tell you he will see that they get justice and quickly however Jesus poses a question when the son of man comes will he find faith on the earth from this passage we need to learn one lesson that transformed by prayer persistent prayer is transforming prayer persistent prayer is transforming prayer let's go to first samuel chapter 1 first samuel chapter 1 i will select a few verses then we get seven points and we will be done first samuel chapter 1 verse 1 the bible says we are in bible study so i expect you to be reading your bible first samuel chapter 1 we will read verse 1 it says there was a certain man from ramathaim a zufite 
from the hill country of Ephraim. His name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Verse 2. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Verse 3. Yet, year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were priests to the Lord. Let's jump to verse 6. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Let's read that again so that we don't miss the point. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her. Kept provoking, kept provoking that the problems are persistent. Therefore, the prayer must be persistent. When problems are persistent, the prayer must be persistent. Our problems are persistent. Our prayer life must be persistent. If you understand me, say amen. Her rival kept provoking. You cannot address persistent problems with erratic prayers. You cannot address persistent problems with erratic prayers. Persistent problems require a persistent prayer life. If you understand the word of God, say amen. Verse 7. This went on year after year. If problems go on year after year, how should your prayer life be? Year after year. When problems are for year after year, your prayer life should be year after year. When your problems are year after year, your, your, your prayer life should be year after year. Yeah, persistence in prayer. Why? Because the problems of this world are persistent. Our prayer life must be persistent. Our enemy, the devil, is persistent. Our prayer life must be persistent. If you understand the word of God, say amen. amen. Problems are what? Persistent and our prayer life should be persistent because when you stop praying, the prayer, the problems don't stop coming. This went on year after year. Whenever Anna went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. So, year after year, the servant of the Lord, Anna, went to the house of the Lord because persistent prayer is transforming prayer. Let's now get some lessons from the passages we have read. We have already learned in our previous presentation that there is no need to pray if you won't pray all the way. Only persistent prayer is transforming prayer. For this afternoon, point number one, point number one, you do not have to be in a group or team in order to persist in prayer. You do not have to be in a group or a team in order to persist in prayer. You don't have to be part of any special group of people who pray for you to persist in prayer. 
You don't need to register with a group of strangely behaving, strange talking, strange eating group of people for you to be persisting in prayer. The widow in Luke chapter 18 was alone persisting and she got what she wanted. Anna was alone even without husband supporting her prayer. She was alone persisting in prayer for a child and God granted it. We are not saying being in a group is a problem, but we are saying that you as an individual, you are enough to persist in prayer. Just as you are, you are a one man army, you are a one woman army armed with prayer to face whatever comes in life. Pray, pray, pray. You don't need anyone when heaven is listening to you. It is good when we come together to pray, but sometimes there are certain things we can't tell God unless we are alone. There are certain expressions we can't express from deep within us when I know you are listening. There is a prayer I can't make for myself when I'm on a microphone and there is a camera looking at me. There are prayers I can only make when I've looked everywhere to make sure there is no one listening and I speak to God. I am here to tell you there is a power in private personal prayer. Amen. Eli was seated there and looking at Anna praying and he said, this woman must have drunk something and came and said, are you drunk? Are you okay? Because Eli could not hear what Anna was praying. Why? Because Anna decided to persist in personal prayer and God answered that personal prayer. Do you know what that tells me, friends? That when you are in a family and it's a family problem, you don't need to loop in your spouse. Eli was okay. Uh, Elkanah was okay because already he had another wife and child, children, isn't it? But it is Hannah who needed a child. He need, she needed children. And so she persisted in prayer. We don't hear of the husband praying for a child. What do we learn? If there is a problem in your family, you don't need family prayer. You are alone sufficient to pray about it. It will be nice if the family came together to pray. But you may find one character in the family doesn't have enough faith. Yeah, these things we are praying about and what have you. Leave them behind and pray to God. And God will answer prayer. And that person will be lucky that they married a prayer person. What does the church say? Amen. Jesus goes with the disciples to pray. And when they get to the garden, there are 11 disciples plus Jesus. He leaves them behind and he takes three, Peter, James, and John. And he says, can we go over and pray? But when they get there, he does not pray with them. Because what he is about to say, he doesn't want them to hear. He tells them, I want you three to stay here and pray. And he goes a little further and he opens his heart and says, Father, I don't want to do this thing. I don't want to do this thing. Do you know that there are some times when you don't even want to do the Lord's work? The people in the church are so difficult and you just want to pray and say, God, can you set me free from this church work? I don't want to do it. And you can't pray that prayer when they are listening. It could be maybe you are the head deaconess and you have tried creating a roster but every Sabbath there is a small group of women who disrupt your roster. And you want to make a very honest prayer to God about them but you know you can't pray before, before them that prayer. There are certain prayers that only require one person in the presence of God. Hallelujah church. 
And Jesus went a little further and said, Father, I don't want to take this thing. If it is possible, take away this cup. It's too much. Set me free. That's point number one. You do not have to be in a group or a team to persist in prayer. The widow of Luke 18 was alone. Anna was alone. Jesus several times was alone. The disciples will go and search him and say, hey, where is Jesus? Then they will find him praying until one day they told him, Jesus, can you teach us to pray? Because we've been waiting for you to wake us up to go and pray. Jesus never did that thing of waking up people at 3 a.m. He will wake up alone and disappear. Leave them sleeping. When they wake up, they say, where did he go? And eventually they discovered the power in his life is in prayer. And now they made the request, teach us to pray. If you've been waking people up and nothing is working, leave them alone. You continue praying. Continue praying. Number two. Point number two. I told you I will just give you seven points. Then you will ask questions. Point number two. Prayer is doing something. <laughs> Point number two is prayer is doing something. Now let me explain. There are some hypocrites who tell you and tell me that don't just pray, do something. <laughs> And I came to announce to you that praying is doing something. <laughs> hey, don't just pray. Can you do something? Some of you just like praying. You think prayer is everything. I came to tell you that prayer is something. And I don't expect all believers to say amen. Because those people who tell us not just to pray are also in church. Their silence is a testimony of their life. When we pray, they say, don't just pray. We are in agreement. But we also want to inform you that prayer is doing something. When Anna prayed for her child, wasn't she doing something? When this woman in Luke 18 persisted praying to this unjust judge, wasn't she doing something? Who says that prayer is not doing something? I want you to let it sink in that prayer is doing something. Some hypocrites tell us to pray, not to pray, but do something. As if prayer is nothing. As if prayer doesn't count. Prayer is something. I thought there are believers who will say amen. Prayer is something. Sometimes, listen, sometimes prayer is the only thing that can be done. Do you know that there are times in life when there is nothing else you can do except do what? Pray. So when you say do something, don't just pray. When time comes when prayer is the only thing, what do you do? I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that when you are praying, you are doing something. We are not saying it's the only thing, but we want you to let it sink in that when you pray, you are doing something. Prayer is doing something. Sometimes prayer is what you do in addition to what must be done. We have bought cheaper fertilizer, I'm told. We have dug the farms. We have the seed. So we are waiting for the rain. What are we supposed to do? Prayer is doing something. Prayer is doing something. When you have paid school fees for your child and your child has gone to a boarding school, now you can't do anything. You can't see them. You can't interact with them. You don't know what kind of friends they are interacting with. I'm here to tell you that prayer is doing something. 
When your children are abroad, you can't see them. You see them on a small screen of a, of a video call. And they are talking to you. You can't see. You are trying to see them and also see the background to see if you can understand what is going on. But you can't see much. After 20 minutes of talking, it goes off. You don't know whether they are still on the way. You don't know whether they are okay. You don't know whether they are doing well. I came to tell you that prayer is doing something. When you have been unwell and you have been told that try this medication, we see how it will react. When you have the medication and you have your sickness, I'm here to tell you prayer is doing something. Hey, I thought there are believers in this house. I'm saying that prayer is doing something. So when you are praying, you are not wasting time. When you are praying, it's not because you don't know what to do. Because prayer is one of the things that is supposed to be done. So don't look at prayer as a miscellaneous item that after you do the main things, now you can pray. Or oh, closing prayer and opening prayer. No, prayer is an activity in itself. No, let's, let's, let, let, let's, let's, let's take that a little further so that you get the point. Can you take the story of Anna and remove her prayer life, then retell that story? Because prayer is not anything. We are supposed to do something instead of just praying. So take the story of Anna and remove prayer. Now retell the story. Is there a story? Is there a story? That tells you that prayer is something. What do believers say? Amen. And I pray that somebody will one day testify in this church that prayer has been something to me. Number three. If it is important enough, you will persist in prayer about it. If it is important enough, you will persist in prayer about it. What does that mean? When you badly want justice from an unjust judge, you will persist. When you badly want a child to silence a rival wife, you will persist. The reason why we don't persist in prayer is probably because we don't have priorities. We don't know what is important. We don't know what matters. Because if it is important enough, you will persist. But the next point will even clarify why we don't persist, yet it is important. Because if it is important enough, you will persist. You will not rest until you achieve what you want. If it is important enough. Why did you stop praying if it was important enough? Why did you stop praying about it if you think it was important enough? Let's go to another point. Let's go to the next point. It may clarify that. N number four. If you know that God can do it and he is willing, you will persist. If you know that God can do it and he is willing, you will persist. The reason we don't persist is because we doubt whether God can do it and we doubt whether God is willing. And that's why very important things in our life, we don't persist in prayer because we think some witch doctor may do it better than our God. Because we think some connection, some network is more important than our God. Because we think if we have enough money, it will work better than our God. I'm here to tell you that the day you think the agenda is important and no one else can deliver except God, you will persist without being told. Maybe let me put it in other words. The saddest thing about not persisting in prayer, it means you don't trust God. The saddest thing about not persisting in prayer means that you have a plan B to God. The way you behave in a shop that sells the only item you want and the way you behave in a shop that sells an item that can be found in other shops is not the same. 
When you know this is the only shop you can get the item you want, your behavior is different. You are humbler and more persistent. But when you know that 10 other shops can supply the same thing, there is some arrogance and there is some degree. Watch I kai, watch I kai, tunisawa, ntakuja next time. Because you have options. Can I tell you something sad, friends? The reason we don't persist in prayer is it seems we have an option to God. It seems we have an option to God. So we come and do one prayer or two, then we observe Villa and behave, and come attack Kujibu. Anyway, it's okay. So we go to the other plan. That is why we don't persist in prayer. And that's a very sad realization that you have another God. Yet the Bible says in the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other God. But here you are, you have other gods. You may not call them gods, but indeed you treat them as gods. That's why you come to God and you throw him the prayer request. It's like asking somebody for money when you know there are 25 other people you can ask for money. Unazansa idea 1,000. Ama wacha ikai. Uh, I'm a watcher, idea one thousand. It's okay anyway. I, I realize you are taking long to respond. Unezan is idea. That's what happens when you think you have alternatives. Let me ask you, church, do you have an alternative to our God? But how comes you don't persist in a prayer? By the way, the Bible has a story Jesus gave of a man who received visitors and he went to ask for bread from a neighbor who was a friend. He knew the friend had bread. He knew this guy is my friend and he knew there was a hunger at home. He stayed at the door knocking. The man eventually inside decided to respond and say, listen, I'm in bed with my children and I am in no mood or intention to wake up and open the door to give you bread. But the Bible says this man kept knocking, persistent, saying, I know in the whole of this town, the only person who cares for me and can give me bread is this one saying he can't wake up. So the only option is to do what? So let me ask you, why did you stop praying? What is your alternative to God? What did you st why did you stop persisting in prayer? You got unwell, prayed about it. Now you don't pray about it so much. It's because you have airfare to India? <laughs> Is that your alternative to God? Why you stopped praying? Why did you stop praying about that child? Is because you enroll the child in a, with a good counselor, a good mentor, a great person that people are seeking? Is that your alternative to God? Why did you stop praying? No, I'm just asking you, friends, because we are supposed to persist in prayer, and it is persistent prayer that is transforming prayer. But we are not praying because clearly we have an alternative to God. Those who have no alternative will stay knocking at that door until it opens. And the good news is that the man who said, I cannot wake up, woke up and gave the loaves. Hey. Ata ingekua movie munge nyamaza ivo. Si munge sema, yeah! When the door opens and the bread is given, I'm here telling you that the man woke up and gave him bread. What do you say? And that's good news for us. Hallelujah. Amen. Number five. I told you seven points, then you ask questions. Persist with the clarity of what you want. Persist with the clarity, clarity, clarity. It has to be clear. Clarity, clarity. When you read verse 3 of Luke 18, that lady was very clear on what she wanted. And there was a widow in the town who kept coming to the unjust judge saying, Grant me justice against my adversary. And when you go to First Samuel, Anna was very clear on what she wanted. Give me a child. Give me a child. Let me ask you friends, are you clear on what you want? Because everyone who went to Jesus, do you know they were asked to clarify? Blind Bartimaeus say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then Jesus says, come. 
Then they tell him, cheer up, he's calling you. When the blind man gets there, what does Jesus say? What can I do for you? I mean, isn't it obvious what a blind man wants? But Jesus says, can I get some clarity? What do you want? What is it that you want in your life? Can I get some clarity? What can I do for you? Because you are a blind man, maybe you lack clothes. Maybe you need a marriage partner. Maybe you need money. What can I do for you? And so, brothers and sisters, are you clear in your prayer? Are you clear enough to know when God answers your prayer? Or your prayers are so amorphous that even when God responds, it will take somebody else to let you know that God has responded. <laughs> There's a certain Adventist friend of mine who has been praying for, for a spouse. So has been telling me so many things and the other day was very frustrated and said, now God does not even answer prayer. Then I said, but what about the other person you say does not look very nice, does not dress well? Wasn't that a prayer from God? That person contacted you, that person talked to you, some, that person, I mean, is it that you have lost sight when God answers prayer? That you, do, you are not clear on what you want to the extent that other people can see. Because when you started praying, nobody was talking to you. You were only talking to your relatives or yourself. Now God has brought people who you have given labels, doesn't speak nicely, doesn't have enough education, doesn't have a job. Aren't these people? Aren't these people? Now you are saying, God has not answered my prayer. Is because you lack clarity. Are you clear enough on what you want? I think you, you got the point. You got the point. The Luke 18 widow was clear. Anna was clear. Even Jesus was clear. All the prayers we bump in the Bible are clear. The prayer of Jabez. Keep me from pain. Expand my territory. What is your prayer? You remember Elijah and the servant? They went to a cave after fire came down. And Elijah knelt down to pray and kept telling the servant, check if the rain is coming. He was praying for rain. Not travelers, not preachers in India and churches burning in Russia and other scum that we share around. He was just praying for rain. 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 Eventually, after seven times prayer, the servant says, I don't know how you will take this, but I see a very tiny cloud, very tiny cloud. When your prayer is clear, you see the answer even before it becomes real. And Elijah stood up and said, can you tell the king to get home before a flood destroys him? Flood from that tiny cloud is because he was clear in prayer and he knew that there is the answer coming. There are several answers to your prayer that have come to your life. But because you have never been clear about the prayer, you still complain to God that he has not answered your prayer. I'm waiting for us to meet by the table upstairs. When you will be asking God, why didn't you answer my prayer? Then he will unleash for you a few video links in heaven to prove to you that your prayer was answered. But because you are never clear, you never saw the answer. Be clear on what you want. Persist on what you are clear. If we are together, say amen. amen. Number six, God will grant it to those who persist. Number seven, God may say no at the beginning of the request, but it will, it will not always be a no. Number six, God will grant answers to those who persist. Luke chapter 18 verse 7. Point number seven, God may say no at the beginning, but he will not always say no. Luke chapter 18 verse seven. Let's read that verse. It says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Jesus says, anyone who cries 
day and night will get the answer. Do you know what he's saying? Anyone who is persistent will get the answer. 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 That's what he says. Those who pray to him day and night. And then he says, will he keep putting them off? What does that mean? God may say no at the beginning, but he will not always say no. He may say no because you are not ready this year, but he may say yes the following year when you are ready. God will not always say no. Persist in prayer. Praise the Lord. That's the end of my seven lessons. So I want to tell you, persistent prayer is transforming prayer. It's now time for question and answers, and I will only al allow three, and we are done. Three questions and answers. You raise your hand, three, quickly. Only three. Three that I see initially. The rest, mutaenda kujiuliza nyumbani na mujijibu. Are we together? One. There is one here. Have you seen the one there? There is one there. The district. Oh, there is another one. There is another one behind there. I've seen another. And this region of the church, is there any hand? I think those two are sufficient. We will listen to those two. Then we'll get done and pray and get out of here. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lumumba. I got two questions. Uh, we have learned that don't pray unless we'll pray all the way. Now, I'm trying to imagine as you grow older, you get different needs. And once you want a need, you pray for it. Then once you get the need, should you drop praying for it or you just continue praying for the same thing that you've gotten? Because as life continues, you're going to meet a given need. I don't pray for that need also. So I think, how long will be the list if you pray for everything? And is it good to drop the things that you've gotten? And then the other question, I, I couldn't find the verse, but somewhere in the Bible it says that my house or my temple is the house of prayer. But occasionally we come to church in the morning up to the afternoon. But uh, I don't want to be judged by this, but we can number the minutes we take in prayers. There are a lot of activities going between morning and evening, which are not prayers, of course they are important. But my question is, are we doing the right thing? If my house is out of prayers, but the ministry we give to prayer is very limited, are we doing the right thing? Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's respond quickly to that. Uh, number one, we will begin with the last question and say, when the Bible says this is a house of prayer, prayer is not only when we close our eyes and pray, by the way. But our, some of our songs are prayers. Are we together? Guide me, O the great Jehovah. Isn't that a prayer? So I think our entire life in the church is actually a prayer to God. So it's not just about maybe kneeling down and closing our eyes that it is the prayer moment. Uh, the first question, when you stop praying about something is because you have... The Swahili say, atafutae hachoki. Akichoka, amesha pata. That means if I've been praying to pass an exam, when the results come out, I don't have to continue praying about it. So when we say that we must pray all the way, is that our life is a prayer all the way. All the way of an agenda from its beginning to the end, but also all the way of my life, I keep praying about various issues. So you may pray today for a spouse. When you get the spouse, now you start praying for a child. When you get a child, you start praying to parent the, ch the child better. So you keep going. That's what it means. Last question. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, God is good? All the time. And all the time? So I have two questions. One, uh, when you ask Jesus to pray for you, when will you again pray for yourself? As in, what lines will you use to pray for yourself again the next time you pray now? 
after today for example you've, pray, you've asked Jesus to pray for you today how will you pray tomorrow uh, second question <clears throat> can the prayer of a hypocrite to a faithful person be heard by God eh? can a prayer of a hypocrite to a faithful person be heard by God well let's try let's try I hope I understood and let me begin with the last one and say that many times God by his own mercy answers our prayers <laughs> are we together friends it's not because we are good it is possible a hypocrite can pray and God out of his grace generous kindness decides to grant the favor not because God is approving the hypocrite behavior of the person who prayed but because God has decided to show kindness to the one we are praying for. I may go to pray for a patient just out of my role as pastor, so I go there and just say a prayer out of routine, and God in his kindness heals the person. Not because God approves my bad behavior, but because God is good. The first question, that was a difficult question. I was trying to understand that question. What was that question again? That, what did you say? I don't know. Did you understand the question? I, I didn't get it. That's... Yes. Hey, you have asked Jesus to pray for you. Yeah. So, the next time you, you pray again, because uh, praying is ceaseless. You mm. can't stop praying. Mm. So, what are the lines that you will use? What... what what are your own words that you will use next time? And how will you know that Jesus didn't pray for these words that you're praying for now? Now, when, we, okay, I think what our brother is asking is that when you have asked Jesus to pray for you, you don't need to pray again. But let me explain that all the prayers that we make, we don't even know how to pray. All the prayers, even the prayer that you think you know how to pray, we don't even know how to pray. So that means all the prayers you make, the Holy Spirit intercedes for you and Jesus also prays for you. So that means you persist in prayer using the same line. Look at the widow in Luke chapter 18. She kept coming to the judge saying, Grant me justice against my adversary. Same line, same line. Anna kept coming to the house of God saying, I want a child, I want a child. Use the same line. Explain yourself as you feel best. Sister White says, prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Wewe fungua ro. The Holy Spirit will translate it and Jesus will pray as he deems fit. So don't feel like I pray yesterday so Jesus has already taken that request. Ni kama ku apply kazi. Ukisha apply once wezi tuma application kwa yo ofisi tena. Ah ah. Prayer is different. Tuma application every hour until you get justice. Amen. Thank you. We were told to stop at uh, 3.15. It's time. May the Lord bless Pastor, you so much. There are, there are two questions from the online viewers. Oh, online viewers. Yes, okay. if, if you can take them quickly. Okay. The first one is from a lady called Achieng. And the question is, since she's praying to God for a spouse, mm. she feels like she has already told God her desire. And then the question is, should I continue if at all it is not yet his timing? So how do you relate between God's timing and persistence? Then there's another question here from someone called Mwangi. He's asking, what counsel would you advise one when a prayer seems to have taken so long to get answers or adds up still with no answers? Should one persist with the same? I don't know, I think. Yeah, when a prayer, when something is irritating you, you talk about it. 
when do we go to the hospitals, ladies and gentlemen? It is when we don't feel, feel well, isn't it? What happens when you feel okay? You go back to your business, isn't it? So, when an issue that you are praying about is no longer an issue, I have good news for you. Your prayer has been answered. So that the thing that was irritating you, God, I want to go to China. God, I want to go to China. My God, I want to go to China. Then all of a sudden you say, Ata China, see in Chimzuri, Megundu, Ata Apa Kenya. Somebody can even make it here in Kenya. Your prayer has been answered. God has answered your prayer. So when it is no longer irritating you and troubling you, abandon that issue because your prayer has been answered. Now there is the lady who has been praying and is asking how long should I pray? Keep praying as long as you believe and feel you need a husband. So if our sister believes she needs a husband, keep praying until God removes desire for the husband or delivers the husband. Whichever comes first. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. Because do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and petition, make your request known to God. So when you are no longer anxious, hallelujah, because anxiety has been treated. Yes, please, this is a grace question. Thank you, preacher. Much of the morning and evening, afternoon delve on the aspect of persistence in prayer which is our take home really but again in the morning during your sermon you alluded to the aspect of apostle paul saying the grace is sufficient now you could be praying over a certain matter for so long and you've remained persistent yet things aren't changing at what point would you say the grace of God is sufficient for you? Thank you so much. Grace of God is... You see, when you read Apostle Paul, he says, I had a thorn, I prayed, then God said. And now he uses the word now. He says, now I rejoice. That means as a result of the grace, the problem is no longer a problem. He says, now, if you persecute me, I'm okay. If you abuse me, I'm okay. If you take me through suffering, I'm okay. That means the prayer he was making has been answered. That's why we are saying, even the, question to this, the answer to this question online, that sometimes when God removes a desire for something, it's an answer to prayer. Maybe, I will use an example. You see, I live with students. Maybe you want to date a wrong person and you are praying, praying, I want this one. When God removes the appetite, isn't it an answer to prayer? That now you no longer have appetite for the wrong person. We all praise God. Hey, we survived that one. Because God removed the appetite. So the answer to prayer is not just that when I pray for a spouse, I get a spouse. No, the answer to prayer may be I become comfortable living without a spouse. Sitkopo, watu wa mungu mbarikiwe sana. Persistence in prayer is transforming prayer. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, teach us to be persistent in prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.